So, uh, so today we're sort of landing the plane with, with this series. And the series is basically stories, stories from the book of Acts that were dedicated, that were basically stories of transformation, of lives being changed. And the way sort of we approached this was uh, we sort of pulled archetypes out of the archetypes, like types of people who were converted. So today we're going to talk about the believer. So, uh, and, and the reason why, you know, archetypes are important because we can identify with them, right, to one degree or another. And some, some people, some person, s- somebody can identify as the unbeliever or the believer or the enemy or the seeker, all these, all these people that we saw in, 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 the, in the book of Acts. The, so if you're a believer, this, if you, you may be I believe, a believer if this, I'll give you some lists, right, that you love God and have a lifestyle to show for it. Maybe you're a believer. You also know that there's something significant missing, even though you know God and you have a lifestyle to show for it. You may be struggling with pride because you are a believer. You might have been a believer for a while. And you might be struggling with guilt because you are falling short and you are, you know, there are secrets, there are things in your heart that you haven't resolved. You're trying to reconcile being a Christian and being stuck. You may be a, may be a believer if you're in that place, right? Um, so I'll give you some more lists down the road, but start thinking about how you identify with these characters in the Bible. Um, you may, uh, anyone here of Italian descent by chance? Uh, my wife is, there's a few people here. Okay, so the first unbeliever, oh, Gatozzi. Gatozzi, Gatozzi. It's a, it's a Matthew Gatozzi. Uh, so yeah, Deb is of Italian descent and a few others. So the first non-Jew being converted in the Bible was Italian. Did you know that? And that's a pretty cool thing, right? And this guy, you know, it's really amazing because he was also, like, the timing of this is amazing because it's Memorial Day. He was also a warrior. Um, In Acts 10, verse 1, it says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known the Italian regiment. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. The reason why there was an Italian regiment in Caesarea is because not all Roman regiments were Italian. They were not all from Italy or from Rome. In Caesarea, historically, most of the legionnaires of the of the professional soldiers were from Syria. And there's this one regiment that was actually from Italy. So Cornelius was one of them. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to, to, pray to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he said. The angel said, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. Now, if you want to know, this is a fascinating story. One of the most amazing personalities in the book of Acts. And the reason for that is because this is the first non-Jew to be converted, according to scholars. And uh, this guy was a Roman, Italian, warrior, legionnaire. He probably looked like this, right? Um, um, that's how typically he would look like. And the, the fascinating about centurions is that this is not a, this is not a high-powered general. This was both a leader in the, of the troops, but also a warrior. This is sort of the smallest unit in the Roman uh, army was the, uh, the human, unit of 100. That's where the name centurion comes from. And when they historically, according to this, um, to this, this historian called Vegetius, uh, they were... Uh, they were um, they selected centurions according to very strict guidelines. One, you had to be literate, because you had to be able to to read orders, right? And not a, a lot of people were literate back then. It's not, it wasn't like a normal thing. Uh, you had to be uh, uh, over 30 years old, mature. You had to be a big guy, and that was it was literally stated. You have to be a big guy, so I wouldn't qualify at all, right? So and 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 they they had several t- sort of it's almost like a certification type process, right? You had to be able to use a sword, uh, your sword a certain way, to throw a javelin uh, far enough. You had to be a real, real warrior and a leader all at the same time. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about not just a guy 
who, who told people where to go. We told the, we, we're talking about a guy who was on, in the, on the front line. He's a tough guy. He's a warrior. And at the same time, Scripture tells us he's a compassionate warrior. He served the poor and he prayed to God. And it was such an unlikely thing for you to be a Roman, to be in a distant um, province, and to actually start liking the God they were worshiping to the degree where you pray to him. Right? So it's a very unusual thing. And, you know, another thing it's, it's fantastic about this thing is that this is a guy who's a believer and yet at the same time there's something missing. It's clear from the text that he is maybe a, a sympathizer of the Jewish faith but not a cir- circumcised convert. Like in between. How many of you have experienced that maybe you're that person, maybe you know of somebody like that? You know of somebody who's like a Christian but not a Christian? You know, you're really humble here if you go, yeah, that's me right there, you know. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about, right? Like you're, you can be like, you like Jesus, but you don't, he's not your Lord. He doesn't tell you what to do necessarily. Like what you hear from Jesus in scripture is more of a suggestion, right? But you still pray. So you have a life to show for it on one side and you pray and you have a sincere, like a sincere desire to connect. And you, know, this, and you give to the poor. I mean, that's sacrificial. This guy was giving to missions, right? And yet at the same time, there are things that are pieces that are missing. And the amazing thing about the insight about this particular interaction with the angel is this. You know how you can sometimes do like, you go, I, I think I'm a Christian, but then I, I feel disconnected or I feel guilty about this thing. So maybe I'm not anything. Like, I'm, who, who am I? I'm I'm broken. And what the angel was telling this guy is this. God notices what you do. He pays attention to your heart. Even if you fall short, he pays attention to your heart and your desire to obey. And that's what he said. He says, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. You see that? See, you know, actions don't save us, but actions are a reflection of faith. They matter. What you do matters. When you give to the poor, it matters. You know, you might not have all of your act together, but when you pray, you allow God to enter your your reality. And that's what's happening here, right? Uh, The angel acknowledges this. And then on the other side of, like in in a different city, another guy is praying. And notice that this is a story about two men that were praying men. Two men that basically, with their posture of heart, with their time and their effort, are telling God, I don't have it all figured out. Please t- tell me what to do. Please guide me. And sometimes you are a believer and you don't pray. And what I'm, I'm telling you is, please pray. Even if you don't have your act together, even if you feel distant from God, please pray. So there's another guy, his name is Peter, and he's, he starts praying, and he starts seeing, starts seeing these very strange visions, like there's a carpet, there's a, there's a table, and it descends from heaven, there's all kinds of animals, and the, the voice in his vision is saying, uh, kill and eat, and some of those animals are sort of not kosher, not, you're not supposed to eat them as a Jewish person, and then, and then Peter responds, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And then it's, it happens over and over again, and he starts realizing that it's a metaphor about not, that the gospel was not just intended for the Jewish people, that it was intended for everybody. That's what happens. And as he realizes that, uh, this is, this, we pick it, pick it up in verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the man, I'm the one you're looking for. What have, why have you come? The man replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. You know, here's another insight from this, both on the Cornelius side and the, and the Simon Peter side. When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, 
be okay with being inconvenienced by it. Right? Have you ever felt a, a, a nudge from the Holy Spirit and you know it's from the Holy Spirit and you ignore it? It's an unfortunate choice. Right? And the thing is, the nudge always comes and feels inconvenient. Guess what? Because it, God wants you to experience more than you're experiencing. By definition, the actions required for that are an inconvenience. You have to break the cycle, a rhythm, a habit. That's, what, that's how it works. So if the Holy Spirit tells you, go there and do this, or speak to that person, or listen to that other person, be okay with being inconvenienced, right? Are you a believer? Here's a few other questions. Do you know scripture and still don't make disciples? You may be a believer if that's, that's you. Do you selectively obey God's will? Are you using religious behavior or financial generosity as your membership card? It doesn't work that way, let me just tell you. Are you willing to change what needs to be changed? Those are very relevant questions, are they? They arrived, uh, so in Acts 10, 24, they arrived in Caesarea the following day. And here's a little side note. This is not a me mere inconvenience. Hey, pay attention to this coworker and share to him about, about Christ or talk to someone who is behaving a certain way, even in the church, and help them challenge them with Scripture. So that kind of inconvenience. The inconvenience of Peter was leave and walk for a full day and a full night. Maybe camp somewhere, arrive the next day. That's the kind of inconvenience we're talking about. You know, there was no Tesla available. Does that make sense? That's the kind of inconvenience. You obey what Jesus tells you to do to that degree. Uh, Cornelius was waiting for them and called together his relatives and close friends. This guy is a leader. This guy, you're the only one who has a Tesla. I know that. It wasn't, it wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. It was a, more, it was a broader statement. I know they're laughing at you. I want to I let, you, let you off the hook. It was not about Robert. The Tesla thing was not about Robert. It was about a car. I know they're like doing this. Come on. And let him just enjoy the sermon. He's a good guy. <laughs> but this Cornelius guy, you may be a believer if you invite your friends along in your journey. He goes, I don't even know what this angel told me something to get this guy. I sent some people. I don't even know what he's going to tell me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite my friends and relatives to listen to them. This should be good. Right? I just love that about Cornelius. What an, what an exceptional guy. What an exceptional guy. So proactive. Right? Um, as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshiped him. Now that's, that's a zealous guy, right? Now it's a little misguided because Peter says, Peter pulled him up and said, stand up, I'm a human being just like you, right? Okay, too much, too much. Uh, so they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. But he, you can see just the demeanor of this man. Think about this, like it's so unusual. This is an, this is an occupying army in a, in a foreign country. And this guy was an army officer, a warrior, who loves God, serves the poor, prays to this Jewish God. And a guy comes in, a Jew from a completely different tribe. They could have, it, would, it was such a no-no, and he falls at his feet trying to worship him. What an amazing human being. Even if, even if it's a bit too much, what an amazing human being Cornelius is, right? And Peter, is, he's as stunned as Cornelius is, right? He's going, what on earth is going on, right? And he, he tells him that it's unlawful. He understands that it's unlawful for him as a Jew to enter the house of a Gentile. What is God doing? See, it's, you know, so it's on both ends, right? And what happens is, so they start talking and they exchange accounts and what's going on. So what happened to you? What happened to you? Why, why am I here? Why are you here? You know, all of those things, right? And I love that in, in Acts 10.33, he concludes his account, Cornelius, with this. Now we're all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. 
You see the posture of heart, how humble this guy is? And, 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 and let me point this out. You may be a believer if you have even loved God sincerely and, and loved the poor and prayed to him, but have settled into a, lifetime, a lifestyle of sin. You may be a believer. Will you welcome a human being correcting you from Scripture then? Because that's just part of what a believer is. You know, you, you, you rally, you, you connect with God, you align with God, and then things happen. And you, and, and you tend to settle into a life of sin. And it could be all kinds of sin. It could be sins of omission or sins of commission. But you settle because it's a combination of comfort and guilt and shame. And you become stagnant. And you still believe God and it, make, it, it makes it worse because, because you, you, you want to honor God, but you know you're not honoring God. And I think the key here in this story is that will you listen to another human being being able to correct you or rebuke you from Scripture if you're in that place, right? And are you willing to allow your repentance to activate God's power? Because that's what's happening here. And that is the most challenging thing in any church congregation is to have a culture that is like that. Not to have just, you know, one one situation here, oh, wow, that's amazing. No, to have everybody f- be in that place. Hey, I know I'm sincere in my faith. I know that, I, that I've also fallen short, and I know that I'm living a double life or might be falling into this, is, is in this state of, of, of settling into sin and being stuck. But I want out of this. And because, if I, because I want to, I want to allow another human being. And this, think about this. Both men experienced supernatural, pretty powerful interventions from God. Are we in agreement about that? Right? One was a voice, one was an angel, a vision and an angel. I mean, it's terrifying. A guy like like Cornelius, who was a warrior, who looked like he looked like, like how he looked like, it says that he was terrified. That's pretty intense. Like, it takes a lot to terrify somebody like that. And in spite of the fact that there was a direct intervention from God, God still sent somebody to them. God still uses a human being to speak truth to you. And that because, because that's the MO. God does not want you to deal with your stuff alone. It's just not how God works. God will always send somebody to you. Make somebody available to you. Send you to somebody. That's how he operates. And the question is, will you welcome a human being correcting you from Scripture? Will you ask a human being to correct you from Scripture? Will you listen humbly and change? And will you understand that your, your repentance, which is a change of heart, that's what the word means, is turning towards God, is the key to activate God's power. And everybody who has ever repented can confirm that. Repentance is hard. It's painful. You don't want to do it. No one ever wants to repent. Like feeling-wise, right? But once you repent, every single person I've ever known goes, the relief, the joy, the power that comes from that, the growth, the insight, it's just, it's just this elevation of the human being that happens when you repent. And yet most of us struggle with that in amazing ways. And what we want to have is this community of faith where it's normative to repent. It's normative to confess and to invite influence. It's normative to be able to approach somebody and know that it's safe to speak to them some truth and love. Right? And here's what happens when this power gets generated. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out onto the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized? Now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. So we have orders for them to be baptized 
So he gave orders to them, and the wording is not orders, it's really more arranging, right? Uh, for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. That's what, that's what happens when repentance is allowed into a human, a human life, but also a community. What I love about this, this is, this is not a one-on-one meeting. There's people there. You know? And what I want us to do, we're such an individualistic society that it's hard for us to operate that way. And I think it limits us. Right? And what we want to do in this community is, is to, to sort of change the culture to a Jesus culture that is powerful enough where we can say, we can admit our fault in public, in a small group, that we can talk to someone and say, look, I feel ashamed, I feel stuck, I, I, I'm sincere, I do this and I do that, and, and I know that it's right before God, but I, I want to grow. And will you change me because I feel stuck? And even more impressive and and hard to do is to actually leave your comfort zone because you know somebody who's struggling and go speak to them. That's even harder to do because we're conflict avoiders, because we want to inconvenience people, because we don't want to come, come across as pushy or arrogant. But it's golden to be able to do that. It's golden to be able to do that. It's so, so important for a community to, to have a culture like that, right? So as we, as we take the, um, the Lord's Supper right now, here's the question for you. Will you imitate Cornelius? You're a believer. Will you find the believer in you? And unless you haven't noticed... Cornelius isn't the only believer in that sense. Peter is as well. See, Peter is the apostle. He is the guide. He is the great Peter. And yet Peter is being taught something here by God. He is in new territory. He is also out on a limb, not understanding exactly what's going on, entering a Gentile's home, seeing amazing power, and following the power rather than following the rules he's used to. Follow. So in that sense, every single person in this room is a believer. And the question is, will you imitate Cornelius' heart? And if you have something to say, something you need help with, something you want to confess, something you can engage somebody with, because God uses human beings to change us, will you talk to someone today? And I want to challenge you today because if you don't do it when you're inspired, you're probably not going to do it. <laughs> right? You know? So here's my encouragement. Con- contemplate it right now as we take the Lord's Supper. And during the fellowship, I know the normal thing is to beeline to your, the person, your go-to person to talk about whatever random stuff you talk about. But maybe give, pause that for like 15 minutes and say, who do I need to talk to for that. Who do I have to have? Who can I talk to in a Cornelius way? And just do it. It's a nice exercise. It's, eventually, it grows into a lifestyle. And that kind of lifestyle produces a lot of power, a lot of change, a lot of transformation. Let's pray.